I want Samoa Joe to remember this match the rest of his career, not the rest of his life. I am Samoa Joe, Kurt. I am undefeated in TNA wrestling. Kurt, you will be broken. <laughs> Welcome to Last Match Standing, the podcast where we review, relive, and rank the 100 greatest wrestling matches of all time. As always, I'm Spencer. I'm undefeated for 17 months. And I'm real. I'm damn real. And today, it's episode 60, the last match of season three. And it's from November 19th, 2006, from the Impact Zone in Orlando, Florida. It's Kurt Angle versus Samoa Joe. And it was a November to remember. Oh, wrong Wikipedia page. I'm it was a November <laughs> to dismember. That was December, oh, wait, December to yeah. dismember. Okay, I get it. Uh, we are coming to you in what is our last match of the season. We hope you enjoyed the double episode Monday, episode 58 and 59. Those are, man, so fun. RVD, Jerry Lynn. ZSJ Ooh. Will Osprey. That was a one-two punch. That's some that good was, wrestling right yeah. there. <laughs> Two yeah. very, very similar matches that were 20 years apart, by the way. Hey, there you go. And now uh, we are excited for the last match of the season, which means we are just a week away from our season three finale. So if you have not completed a, a ranking of your own, a survey ranking of your own, now's the time. Uh, because like you know already, um, anything that you rank, we, we throw all of our listeners' rankings together, and it helps us uh, do any potential re-rankings in our season finale. Uh, and a season finale that will hopefully will feature a special guest, which will be super fun. Absolutely, yeah. Keep your eyes peeled for that one. Guys, this match is about one of the greatest athletes, one, one of the greatest all-around performers ever, coming in and stopping the momentum of a seemingly invincible force in an organization that was just starting to reach its peak. I mean, the timing was perfect. The match did not disappoint. Oh, no. And, Landon, to kind of stand on a point you made with the Zack Sabre Jr. Will Ospreay match, that's what you come to wrestling for? Yeah. This is what I come to wrestling for. Right? I mean, there's a lot to discuss here. I I think let's start with... Where were you when Kurt Angle showed up in the impact zone for the first time? Uh, I was a sophomore in high school. <laughs> I, <laughs> I was probably watching it live, and I was like, oh, my God, Kurt Angle. <laughs> uh, November 19, 2006, uh, was definitely getting ready to go to the seventh grade. I was in seventh grade. Who knows what would have so happened. This, so Kurt Angle showed up in, like, October. is like October. Huge deal. Yeah, he showed up. Was it Huge late? Was it late? Deal. Uh, yeah, it was right. It was before. It was pre-Halloween. I remember that. Yeah, 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 yeah. The news broke. I forget. I know the news broke on um, during one of their shows that they signed him. Correct. I forget what show it was, but it was uh, not Destination X. It was like around this time. The news broke that they signed him, even though because the show was not live. But they broke the news. They like edited in. We have just. Signed Kurt Angle to the TNA, bro- uh, and then like a week later, he shows up on Impact, and it's like, oh my God, Kurt Angle's here! Well, let me tell you something. I'm so sorry, Landon. Let me tell you, it did its job, at least in terms of like it brought viewers to TNA. Oh yeah, because I remember at this point, I hadn't seen much of TNA at all, but I heard Kurt Angle signed with TNA, and I said, oh shit, I have to see this. I mean, it's it's arguably the biggest signing in the history of that company. This is just one of those rare moments in professional wrestling history that completely changes the global landscape of the business. This wasn't just a big deal for TNA, you know, you know, cementing the fact that they could get big stars, whatever. This wasn't just a big deal for WWE, having to seriously consider TNA as an option for their talent to escape to. Yeah. Kurt Angle was also competing in Japan during this time period and was IWGP heavyweight champion throughout this time. Uh, this arrival shook the world. And it opened the door for so many more un- crazy, crazy, unthinkable things to happen during this period in wrestling. Because, I mean, not long after this, they signed Sting. 
they sign Christian Cage. Well, no, Sting was already there. He was. His, yeah, he Sting was already, was already there. there. Yeah, Christian yeah. Cage, I believe, was already there. Rhino had, had showed up, but Kurt Angle is just sort of somebody. So, so Sting was never in WWE. No, well, like they were trying to sign him, and he was like, he didn't like. I, I he explained this recently why he was like, no, nah, I'm not comfortable with that. Apparently, they just wanted him to do a lot of travel, and he's like, no, nah, I'm in my 40s. I don't want to do that much travel. Oh, I can just bring the family down to Orlando and record the, like, three episodes in one week? All right, fine. Pretty sweet deal. Yeah, like, <laughs> if I, you're if you're over 40 and you're in one location and minimal travel, I mean, I can't really argue with, like, that contract, even if it's less money. You can go do outside dates whenever you want. But to your point, talk about something that, that shakes the wrestling world to the core. Because Kurt Angle is just one of those names when you think of – I don't know, top 10 greatest wrestlers of all time. You know, like he's certainly in that conversation. He's in my top five. Uh, you know, so it's just one of those, it doesn't get much bigger than this. So I, to to shake the foundation, like you said, not just TNA, but WWE, Japan, wrestling's landscape as a whole changed from the moment Kurt Angle stepped into the impact zone. Like but, for me personally, Kurt Angle is tied as the greatest wrestler of all time. With? Oh, but I'm a Toyota. Ah, so good. Like if, if if you like twisted my arm, like okay, Kurt's the best male wrestler. She's the best female wrestler. So that would be arm. that would be tied. That's why I have them tied as the best. But Kurt Angle showing up also sparked a rivalry that nobody saw coming, and I would argue is the greatest rivalry in TNA history. Oh, and, it's, and they even say this is the most anticipated match. In at this time, the five year history of TNA. Well, how could they anticipate it if they never saw it coming? Well, I mean, well, I think it's it, well, the anticipation from the moment that <laughs> the from the beginning, right? From from Kurt Angle and Samoa Joe interacting at all. Once the match was signed, to, yeah. You mean, once the match was signed, you mean from the night before Bound for Glory two thousand six, when the headbutt happened. The headbutt heard round. Let's get into it. <laughs> Earl Hebner is in the ring along with Mike Tanay to the accept 50th time to accept the NWA World Heavyweight Championship from Samoa Joe. This was all set up a few weeks prior when Joe defeated Jeff Jarrett at No Surrender in a fans revenge lumberjack match. <laughs> I remember this. Don't ask. Uh, <laughs> I, I actually I do want to ask. <laughs> Fans revenge lumberjack match? Yeah, so this uh, was literally a match between Joe and Jeff Jarrett, and essentially Jeff Jarrett had just got the fans pissed really uh, pissed off. And so the fans were around ringside, and they <laughs> were the lumberjacks, oh. and they all had weapons. Shut up! Yeah, uh, this is why we don't let Vince Russo write wrestling anymore. <laughs> anyway. That's wild. Joe gets the win. Um, I mean, there are plants, but still. Right. It's <laughs> still wild. But... Bitter that Sting had previously been selected as Jeff Jarrett's opponent at Bound for Glory, Joe takes Jarrett's NWA title after the match and tells Jim Cornette that if Jeff or Sting want the NWA title, they could take it from Joe. Joe later agreed to return the belt to the winner of the Jarrett-Sting match so long as he would be next in line for a title shot. And he he had a legitimate claim. I mean, to this point in his career, Samoa Joe had steamrolled through everyone oh, yeah. that they put in front of him. I mean, Mike Tanay says it as he's coming to the ring. He's been undefeated for 17 months. And unfortunately for Joe, his offer was declined. And instead, Joe was told that he would either give the belt back or he would be removed from the TNA roster. Thanks, Jim Cornette. Uh, we've talked a little bit about ways that wrestling promotions, let's say, test the waters with wrestlers. Put them in a position where you can just see how big of a reaction they would get if they were the top guy. This is one of my favorite examples of a pro wrestling temperature check. Having Joe steal the belt, keep it for weeks, and claim that it's his. And you hear the reaction he gets from the fans, keep the title... Clap, Keep clap, the clap, title. Clap. I mean, they loved it. So, with the support from the fans in the impact zone, Joe takes the contract from Mike Tanay, rips it up, throws it in his face, and says, there's your answer. But just when you think you know what's going on, the lights go out. 
Damn, that was good. And let me just pause here and say what a fucking fantastic effect that is. <laughs> Who came up with the idea of shutting the lights out when a new wrestler debuts? It's uh, incredibly exhilarating for no reason at all, and I Eric love it. Eric <laughs> Bischoff, I believe? I don't know. Either Eric Bischoff or Paul Heyman, one of those two. It's one of those things where, quite frankly, <laughs> quite frankly, uh, the <laughs> every time it happens... It doesn't. I don't. It works every time. You get goosebumps every time it, for no reason. So I, they just turn the lights out. It works every time. But it's hype. Okay. Anyway, the lights go out, and rising up from under the floor near the entrance ramp, which no one had done in TNA by at that point, is the Olympic gold medalist Kurt Angle. And Joe doesn't bat an eye. He looks at Angle, lays the belt across the center of the ring, challenging him. And Angle says, "Uh, okay." And headbutts the absolute <laughs> shit out of Samoa Joe. And busting busts himself him open. open. <laughs> oh, yeah. He had a really nasty cut of his forehead. Chaos ensues. Jeff Jarrett runs in and grabs his belt back. And you know what I love here? Jarrett pauses for a second when he gets up to the ramp and just looks at the NWA title. Like... I've got Sting Sunday. I've got Joe breathing up my neck. Now I've got Kurt Angle. Well, fuck. Pretty much. The ultimate takeaway here is the shot of Joe and Angle standing across from each other with the NWA World Championship in between them, foreshadowing on another level. I mean, neither of these guys were even the champion here. Ooh. But here it was, plain as day. We knew what was going to happen oh, in the coming months, yes. years. So Bound for Glory arrives. Samoa Joe is involved in a Monsters Ball match, which was essentially a three-on-one match because uh, everyone yeah. hated Joe. Um, but he gets the win. He's clearly still focused on the NWA World Championship. With this in mind, Jim Cornette announces that if Samoa Joe would interfere in the NWA World Championship match, he would be fired. Angle comes out and says, look, I'm the referee for this match. Yes, Angle was the enforcer for the NWA World Championship match that night. And and says... You don't need to worry about Samoa Joe. I'm here. And after what I did to him, I don't think he's... And of course, that's all he needed to say to prompt Joe to come out and brawl with it's Angle. Like, don't give Joe excuses to attack you because he'll take them. Uh, but, but this is essentially it, right? After Bound for Glory, the match is officially announced. Kurt Angle versus Samoa Joe, Genesis 2006. The headbutt. Could be is that the, is that the single biggest moment in TNA history at this point? I think so. I think one, definitely one of them. Sting arriving in TNA may edge out over it. That was just such a huge moment. Yeah. But the headbutt yeah. could be argued as the bigger moment at this point. I think so. But like I hate to say this, but I think the biggest moment that in history of that company is. Hulk Hogan walking out and shaking hands with Scott Hall and Kevin Nash. I mean, I know it's it's a big fucking deal. See, even I though it even, meant nothing. That doesn't even cross my mind. The entire Hogan Bischoff era of TNA All is 10 weeks wiped of it? from my memory. No, it was a long time. <laughs> well, I mean, the Monday Night Wars that lasted all oh, the time. Right, no. But, but no, that whole era is just, I don't even think about that. Well, anymore. to be fair, that, that TNA had already peaked. 2007 is their peak, yep. and then 2008, and then nine, it just started to go down. And then, I, oh, we got Hogan and Bishop. I would agree with you. Worse. I think there's other people that would argue that they peaked much later, but I, you know, I, I would agree with you there. Um, the promo package at Genesis, oh, man. Oh, very they, rarely in this sport is a man given the opportunity to redefine the sport that has defined him. Yeah. We also got to mention, anytime we l watch a TNA show from this time period, we had the best voiceover artist, TNA Wrestling, cross the line. <laughs> I mean, his voice is deeper than mine, but like that guy's voice is amazing. Yeah, I love that guy. God, that just, I, I really just want to go back and rewatch this entire era of TNA. It's so good. I think of him. I think of uh, Rally Towel Guy. And then I think of random fans in the front row who look disappointed despite getting arguably some of the best wrestling of all time. <laughs> that look disappointed, regardless. <laughs> the, 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 uh, I watched this match like three times back to back to back. There is one fan, and I'm going to talk about him when we get into the match. He just looks so unimpressed. Well, you know what I think of 
the soundtrack to TNA. Oh, it's so good. I think <laughs> I think Mike Tanay and Don West. Yeah. All right. right. I've said it before. I'm going to say it again, and I'll say it again when we cover more matches from this era. That is my favorite commentary duo of all time. They are damn good. They they are. And, of course, we have Earl Hebner as the referee. It just makes sense. For and the 50th it, time. And it is the most anticipated match in <laughs> TNA history. Uh, I do have to say, I actually have, and this is something I, I wanted to talk to everyone about, both Paul, Landon, and the listeners, I've decided uh, I'm going to give out a brand new award. Really? Yes. It's the first of its kind. It's going to be very unique, uh, and I'm going to give it out when it sees fit. Is it shiny? It's so shiny. <laughs> the shiniest. Whatever you're thinking in your head, shinier than that. <laughs> All right? And this award. I don't know. I'm looking at Paul's head right now. It's, it's shinier <laughs> than that. The first ever winner of this award is Kurt Angle. <laughs> well, what's the award? It is the award for the most useless bandage in the history of <laughs> professional wrestling. Yeah, it doesn't take long for that thing to start gushing. Oh, my God. And there's nothing underneath it. There's nothing underneath it. It's like there. It's like, but here's a bullseye on your big, bald head. By the way, there's not a scratch underneath it. It's just here for effect. And listen, I'm aware that 99 times out of 100, bandages and, and casts and all that stuff is totally not legit. However, comma, this one lasts for all of 30 seconds. It's <laughs> pathetic. I mean, it is pathetic. So, Kurt Angle, congratulations on your award. You earned it. <laughs> Squeaky shiny. Oh. Uh, you talk about hard hitting. Both of these Ooh. guys have everything to prove coming into this match. It, it, it's Kurt Angle trying to establish himself as a dominant force in the new organization and meet the expectations of fans around the world. But it's Joe trying to earn his way to an NWA World Championship match and defend his 17-month undefeated streak. Oh, yeah. He wants to prove to everyone that he can beat anyone, no exceptions. It's all eyes on Angle and Joe. And what I think is funny about talking about Kurt Angle here, this is actually my favorite version of Kurt Angle when he first showed up in TNA because if you remember when he got drafted to ECW right before he left the WWE, he started this new character, this new wrestling style where he stopped doing kind of the the comedy stick and was just like this no-nonsense wrestling machine. The only thing I can really compare him to is like a Brock Lesnar, like a Taz, where he puts the mouth guard in and he's just there to like just – embarrass you in the ring he's not gonna do fancy stuff he's just gonna do like technical wrestling he's gonna do the very very realistic grappling sequences and he's going for submissions Mm -hmm. he does the olympic slam but like that's not how he beats you he beats you by making you tap out right and he's scary well i think what's so interesting is you know we've had angle on this list before and his character hasn't been this character no you know what i mean on the list so far but we have had joe on the list before. And I'd argue that it might not be the same Samoa Joe, but in the two other times Joe's been on the list, you've got the the, the uh, X Division triple threat and the Punk versus Joe 2. He is still the same oh, yeah. unstoppable force. And I don't know if there's been a lot of wrestlers in the history of you know the last 40 years that have played the unstoppable force for so long in, so well in like well, four different companies and i'm too. glad you said that because i'm now i'm thinking back to the kurt angle matches we have on the list right yeah i mean night and day from what we get well here. i think my favorite example of that is like the first time we saw kurt in this list was at king of the ring where he kind of starts off as like the kind of i'm kurt angle i'm gonna do suplexes and then he gets pissed off and you start to see this kurt angle and we saw a little bit of this Kurt Angle in the match with The Undertaker. Not quite this intensity, but just the way he wrestled it. And a little bit with Benoit, but that was more like a, I'm the Olympic gold medalist, I'm going to show you how to wrestle. But this is like the, no, I'm going to beat you. I've got something to prove. Yeah. This it, is a really unique point in Kurt Angle's career. Uh, it's hard to argue that there's not a more vicious Kurt Angle, and actually, the way Mike Tanay describes him is 
This is Angle at his most intense. Oh, Absolutely. Yeah. Did you catch the flying forearm plancha from Joe? (laughs) I mean, it drastically changes the complexion of this match in more ways than one. Is this before or after he pulls Kurt out of the ring and then swings him into the barricade head first? Uh, Okay. I enjoyed that barricade spot because I know, I know, but... (laughs) I mean, could it look any more brutal? I mean, he, he Joe takes Angle and just swings him head first into that metal. Well, I thought he, I thought he was going to powerbomb him because he like grabs his legs and pulls him into his shoulders like a powerbomb. And he just comes out. What's he doing? Whoop! Bam! And he hits and he drops him and then gets back in the ring. And you're like, okay. Oh, by the way, this is a minute and a half into the match. <laughs> yeah, let's be very, very clear. This is something that I think uh, is super, super important, not just to the context of us describing and, and reliving the match, but also to the ranking later. This match is only 13 and a half minutes. It's short. It is only 13 and a half minutes, but that means that they are jam-packed minutes, no doubt about it. The slaps. <laughs> Man. I wouldn't call those slaps. I'd call those just... Rocks. Because <laughs> slaps don't sound like that. Uh, there's one moment that really uh, really calls to me. Like, Angle is perched on the top rope, and Joe goes to counter him. But Angle locks in a front face lock. And oh! Joe backs away from the corner to try and slams him down, but eats a vicious DDT. Oh, man. I've just never seen Angle do something that sort of... Like, you know, high-flying lucha, like, it just, it looks so smooth. I really think that may be his time in Japan. Very well he basically, because you got to remember, he only really learned one type of wrestling, and then he goes to Japan, and he's like, oh, I can do this, and I can actually add probably a decade to my career. It's it's just so agile, and and I know that that's a part of his game, right? You see him, he can moonsault, he can keep up with, with pretty much anything anybody else can do. Angle can, can meet you right there in the middle, and it's just a testament to, to how great of a matchup these two are having. But I think it absolutely speaks to this specific matchup with the person he's in the ring with, with Samoa Joe, right? Because as vicious and as strong and as technical and as great as Kurt Angle is, Samoa Joe is the larger man. Oh, yeah. And he's Samoa Joe bigger. is powerful. And so Kurt Angle gets himself in a position where he has to make sort of this drastic move because he knows that he's in a vulnerable position for a guy that is stronger and will also go uh, to the limit to take care of business, just like Angle will. So to pull out something like a Tornado DDT like that, uh, I think says just as much about Samoa Joe as it does about Kurt Angle. Uh, undoubtedly. I mean... I love Joe, but also to your point of them just – they know each other, right? It's not like they're they're dumb and they haven't studied each other. Uh, Joe tries to elbow his way out of the triple German suplex. (laughs) I really love – it's a small detail, easily missed. And and the third one, of course – He's basically – Kirk does like a side slam because he keeps elbowing him. Well, the the third suplex is a release suplex, and Joe takes it – on his head, oh. it almost—it's almost—he like flops like a fish. It's almost ridiculous. It—that's it, the word for it. That is absolutely the word for it. It, it reminds me of during the Zack Saber Jr. Osprey match when he goes for like the—I uh, don't—I forget what this move is called when you basically run into and you basically throw him up in the air and they land flat, but Zack landed on like on his neck. <laughs> it was like that, but reversed. Now he's landing on the back of his neck instead of the front of his neck. Right. Right. It should be noted that, you know, while we describe some of these moments in the match, uh, you have to imagine that for most of them, Kurt Angle is bleeding profusely. Uh, where'd his bandits go? I don't know. Uh, but <laughs> well, like, it, I, 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 the first time I watched him, like, oh, he's bleeding because he got thrown to the barricade. No, no, no. He's bleeding because after the barricade, <laughs> Joe runs all the way around the ring and drives his head into the steel steps. That's exactly right. <laughs> it's like, oh. That's exactly right, and there's a really, like, the imagery is so, so good, because Angle's bleeding so much, and Joe is just having no issue rubbing nope. that blood all over himself, Mm-mm. and I just, you know, it. The, he's a monster. He's absolutely a monster, and so describing this match as we're doing, just know that in that 13 and a half minutes, for, for eight and a half of them, there's blood all over the place. So, Kurt turns it up, the straps come down, gentlemen, and he goes for the Angle slam. 
And this is the thing. We talk about how Samoa Joe is a monster, and he's brutal, and he's the bigger man, and he's doing a lot of, you know, he's beating up uh, Kurt Angle. He's very intense. He's also extremely calculated and intelligent oh, yeah. and uh, knows what he's doing and knows how to counter. Well, that's what makes him so scary. Yes. Joe pulls off the most beautiful arm, arm drag, drag out of the Olympic slam. And then he hits the fucking muscle buster. What a great move. Man, I love the muscle buster. Oh, it's so beautiful. And you think it's over, but Angle kicks, kicks out. out. Oof. Angle kicks out. It should be noted, this is after already receiving one of my personal favorite moves. The tilt whirl backbreaker oh. from, oh. from Samoa Joe. It was oh, so nice. Oh, he does it and like he like hits Kurt in like the back of the neck too. It's vicious. Did you see the height he gets on kicking Angle when he was perched on the top rope? Oh my gosh, insane! Uh, and you could feel the pressure eating away at both of these guys. I mean, the crowd is chanting, "This is awesome!" Obviously, you know, well before people chanted it for every match. Yeah. Uh, this is when it meant something. Yeah, oh, yeah. Well, in TNA, they didn't just say it because two guys walked to the ring. Right. <laughs> they said it because they did cool shit like that. And for the first time, well, listen to us. Like, uh, we're, we're totally, like, uh, you know, chewing out the fans here. It's just like, we're, we're the heels. We're the heels. <laughs> well, no, like I said, there's one fan in the front row. He's by the entrance ramp. I don't want to fat him, but he is a large guy. <laughs> what the fuck? He, he, he's, he's a large man. And he's and he's got glasses on, and he spends his entire match kind of looking at the camera as if he's saying, "This is an impressive." We, we've got eight dudes with baseball bats who just busted through the door into oh, our God. studio right now. Okay, <laughs> listen. If you were at the Impact Zone, November sixteenth, two thousand six, fuck you. That's, but, where, that's, that's where, where we're at. But for every fan like this that just kind of we're stares, not jealous. But for every fan like this that stares apathetically. There's five fans with rally towels and one fan with two rally towels. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and they're one slightly higher than the other so they don't hit each other. <laughs> it's brilliant. So that, that talk about calculated. We talked about how some Joe was calculated. That's so pretty good. We get another attempt at the Olympic Slam, this time successful, but now it's Joe that kicks out. The straps come down. And Kurt locks in the ankle lock. And for the first time. Samoa Joe is placed in a submission that he cannot counter, or can okay, he? Okay, so watching him try to roll with it as Kurt will just step over and maintain the hold, or when Joe tries to kick him off, Kurt's like, nope, pushes the foot away and main. He like uses his chin to hold the foot down to bat his other foot away and maintains control. And then, I don't know how this happened. Kurt steps over, Joe kicks out his leg... It locks in the fucking Kikita clutch. It's insane. This what? was an incredible moment. Uh, he so he forces Angle to turn his body and sweeps his legs to drop him down into the clutch. It's nuts. And I thought for sure that's it. it we're, we're dead center of the ring, and he's got it locked in. Kurt can't go anywhere. And somehow. Kurt Angle is he, able to find Joe's ankle while in the Kukita clutch. We got to remember the ankle's right behind him. He grabs the ankle and starts to twist it, which is just enough to get Joe to let up. And then he just jerks that leg in the middle of the ring and locks the ankle lock back in. This was an incredible back and forth between <laughs> two. Holy shit. You know, they're well known for being submission specialists, both of these guys, and to see it on full display right in the middle of the ring. Uh, Joe is able to get to the ropes to force the break, but Angle hits the Olympic slam. And, and then, then <laughs> wait, I, I, this is the oh, moment. <laughs> this is the moment. There, Listen, taking down the straps is great, but there is nothing, and I mean nothing, better than putting the straps back on. He adjusts them to make sure they're not, like, they're perfect. Just to take them down again. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And then he locks in that ankle lock. I love professional oh. wrestling. You know, he, he turns the crowd, blood all over his face, by the way, turns the crowd, yeah, straps on, adjusting to make sure they're perfect, pulls the straps down, <laughs> and locks in the grapevine, and oh. that's it. I mean, but what I love about this is that Joe, he's so close to that rope, you can see his fingertips away, and then Kurt leans back just enough where he can't grab the ropes, yep. and he has no choice, and after 17 months, Samoa Joe taps 
out. I w- I would love to see the statistics for how many people have actually escaped the ankle lock after Kurt Angle grapevine. The grapevine? The uh, ooh, I don't know, man. That's exactly where I was going. Once the grapevine is in, it's over. It is over. And Genesis 2006 remains TNA's most purchased pay-per-view to this day. Well, I mean, this is considered to be, at least at this point, the highest ranked match in the history of the company, at least to this point. They may have had someone down the line that may have been ranked higher, but as far as I'm concerned, this is probably their best match. Yeah. It's not very, very long, but it doesn't have to be. They are able to tell this story in, what, 13 and a half minutes? That's right. That's right. Convincingly. It doesn't feel like they're rushing to get through it. And as far as the ending goes, Samoa Joe is the Samoan submission machine. But when my Olympic hero locks in the ankle lock, Samoa Joe has no choice but to tap out. And and the story continues after the match. After the match, Joe shows Angle respect. Oh, you can audibly hear it. You can tell him, turn, Earl, get me a microphone right now while, while Kurt is still going like, yeah, I fucking won. Joe wants to shake his hand, but he, but he wants to ask for a rematch. He's, I, he says, that they're going, you tapped out. So you're goddamn right I tapped out because I can admit when on one night somebody is the better man. Kurt Angle, I want a rematch. Hand comes out and Kurt's like looking around. No, wipes the blood off his forehead and walks out of the ring. <laughs> Angle snubs him. Like, I mean, what a blow what? to Samoa Joe. This is the dick. man who is fighting for that claim to the title, who needs that win, and Angle knows it. And it, and again, it speaks to Angle at his most intense, right? Not only did he beat you, but he didn't respect you when he did it. No, not at all. It kind of reminds me of, and this is a weird thing to compare it to, but do you remember whenever John Cena debuted on SmackDown? Yes. They kind of had the same moment where like, okay, Kurt beats this kid, and then he's like, come on, respect me. Fuck you. No. And he like walks out of the ring. Like, I'm not, no, I'm not shaking your hand. You lost, loser. And like leaves. I kind of had the same kind of opinion of that where it's just like, oh yeah, I am better than you. Whoop. And then leaves. He he proved his point. What why, what reason did he have to shake Samoa Joe's no, hand? Right, he, he won. won. That's it. And needless to say, they go on to have some wars. Anybody remember Lockdown two thousand nine? Oh, do I? So we may see another Angle Joe match on this list. We'll see. Which one was literally for all the gold in TNA? Uh, you know, that one just escapes me. I, I think, is that Bound for Glory 2007, maybe? I, I, I don't remember for sure. It's, that sounds right. It's within, it's within a year. They have a, a rematch for every belt in TNA. It's ridiculous. And it just speaks to the testament of, like Kurt this ha- is Kurt. a feud you can hang your hat on as an organization and say, this defines what we do and what we think the sport of pro wrestling yeah. should be about. Because there's one match where Kurt is the TNA champion. He's still the IWGP heavyweight champion. He's both tag champions. Uh, but uh, Samoa Joe is like the X Division champion. <laughs> it's ridiculous. The match is good. I think this one might be a better one, but that match is pretty good too. It's ridiculous. I believe OSW Review covered it though. What, uh, what are some favorite moments, guys? Uh, I've got two. One of them is the, I thought it was going to be a power bomb, but it's actually a big swing into the barricade. <laughs> the second one has to be the transition from the ankle lock into the Kikita clutch, and then somehow back into the ankle lock. That is just next level. Straps going back on <laughs> just to come back down. Yeah, yeah no, the uh, God, it, the 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 flying forearm. Right in the beginning. Oh, to yeah. Set just the pace for the whole suicide dive. match. Yep. Yep. I mean, just awesome. Like, they cut a pace that never lets up in this match. And I think that. I think they were able to cut that pace because they only had, I think, 16 minutes in total. But when you count in entrances and, like, the ending, they only had. They had less than 20 minutes. And I don't think they can cut that pace unless they keep this match under 15 like they did. So, guys, before we get into the ranking here, it's. It is. The season finale of season three of Last Match Standing. And this is our 60th match that we're trying to rank. (laughs) And I don't know about you guys, but this is starting to get really 
really difficult. Well, Andon, I'm glad you mentioned that because I've come up with a new system, a scientific method for making the ranking process quicker and more efficient. I would like to say that I have no idea what's happening right now. So I, I this is the first time I'm hearing of it as well. All right, and I'm over here. I was just like trying to set him up, but now it totally just sounds like, thank God, Paul, what system <laughs> do you have for us? Well, I've come up with four categories in order to make the ranking process a lot easier as opposed to just saying, this match reminds me of that one. So it's good, which is a very subjective viewpoint and we have gotten some criticism. So I come with four categories, gentlemen. The first category is psychology. Just and if you don't know what ring psychology is, it's basically this is the story that the wrestlers are telling in the match. This is what every single movement, every single grapple, every punch, every kick, what it all means. What is it building towards, and how does it relate what's going on before and ap- during and after the bell? Yeah. So the story, the in ring work, which not to be confused with psychology, is like. How they actually pull these off. Uh, how smooth the moves are. Does it look rehearsed? Does it look staged? Does it lo- or does it look legitimate? Uh, the chemistry, how well they work together, i.e., do they look like two people that have never locked up before or do they look like bitter rivals trying to kill each other? That makes any sense. And last but not least, the commentary. And I've said this before and I'll say it again. Good commentary can make a bad match look great, and bad commentary can make the best matches look terrible. I have seen classics with no commentary or shit commentary that I can't watch anymore, and I've seen matches, and I'll give you an example. Uh, The Hulk Hogan Rock match has some of the best commentary I've ever heard in my entire life. And so, anyway, those are my four... four groups. Yeah, so, and, and I think not to say that we necessarily have to only consider these things when we're ranking. We don't have to rely on that, but I think it's a really great resource for us to go yeah. to whenever we're having some of the more difficult discussions. Oh yeah, and to give you an example of how I implemented this, I will go first. So my first category, which was psychology. So these are two of the very, very best wrestlers in the world trying to prove who is the best. Both of these men work so believable. Uh, There's no wasted motion in this match. There's nothing feels frivolous. Nothing feels extra. They just well, not even the putting the straps up. No, it doesn't. It's not frivolous at all. Necessary, Landon. (laughs) No, because that's how Kurt signifies he's going to put the ankle on. Of course it is. Even that does not feel pointless. Like he he's he's doing it to prove a point. Right. He's like I beat his ass. Now I'm going to make him tap out. And I do so, love it for the record. Oh, yeah. So this <laughs> match is, here. quite frankly, is just hard-hitting action from bell to bell. And you believe it because they believe it. And that makes it for more compelling watch. The in-ring work in this match is damn near flawless. Uh, if there's a botch in this match, I sure as hell missed it. They work so smooth. And... Like just the soap is the fluidity of how they wrestle, and some of these reversals are fucking breathtaking. Like we talked about that ending sequence where they Kikita clutch. I'm sorry, ankle lock to Kikita clutch, and then back to ankle lock. Are you fucking kidding me? I've never seen that before. Their chemistry. This might be one of, if not the best pairings that I have seen on our list so far. And to again to reiterate for the in ring work, the work is just so. It feels so effortless. It just feels natural. It feels like these two were born to wrestle each other. This is like, I mean, I realize it's probably the very first match they've had, but it's definitely the first one we've seen on television. I'm pretty sure they probably had some dark matches or just practiced to rehearse some of these things Mm -hmm. on their own time, but it doesn't feel that way. This feels organic. It feels, I don't want to say raw, but it just, you know what I mean? When when you're watching two people that just click. Mm -hmm. And the final one, which is the commentary. And once again, Mike Tanay, Don West, all-time favorite commentary team, and they just effortlessly make the smallest moments in this match feel like the fucking Titans are clashing. And that being said, this match is, in my opinion, the best match from TNA, at least from this era. My ranking for this one, my ceiling is going to be number 12 behind Hokuto and Kendo. I would not go any higher than that, and I would not go any lower than Tiger Mask and the Dynamite Kid. 
Which and where's that one? Just for the listeners. Uh, last I checked, I believe that's number twenty one. Okay. Uh, Tiger Tiger Mask and Dynamite Kid is number seventeen. Seventeen. Sorry. <laughs> okay. So we're looking somewhere from twelve to seventeen. Twelve to seventeen in that range. So, that's my personal range, and I am always open to discussion. And if you guys disagree with me, I'm I'm here for it. That's why we do this. Th- thank you for breaking that down. I like the new system. Um, I I'm gonna go a little bit a different route. I think the obvious thing to do for this one is to compare it to other TNA matches in the list. And I went out of my way to not do that. I know. I know. But, but uh, you know, I, let me just go there real quick just as a devil's advocate. And for me, it does fall short of what the inaugural X Division Championship match was able to accomplish. Um, also, what Joe was able to do with Styles and Daniels. So for me, it's going to go already underneath the previous TNA matches we have. Those were just incredibly special matches. Oh, yeah, Not absolutely. to take anything away from this one, but... It's it still just, in my range. It didn't quite go to that, <laughs> that place. So the next thing that I look at was, what about Joe's other matches, right? Um, it, it, namely, his Broadway with CM Punk, currently at 13. Uh, that match, similarly, captured Joe at his peak. You talk about chemistry, you talk about uh, just like Punk. psychology in that match through the roof. Well, you know, Samoa Joe and CM Punk had a 90-minute uh, two out of three falls match shortly after that one, which I don't think had a, dis- a, dis- a decisive winner. And that feud just highlighted what Punk and Joe were able to do when pushed to their limits. So uh, this was not Joe and Angle pushed to their limits. No, I know both of these guys have more in them, and there was a reason for that. They knew this was the first in a series. So all that said, I certainly don't see this going higher than, for me, Nakamura Ibushi at 21. 21. But I wouldn't really go any lower than, say, a DIY revival at 33. And and I know that's a large range, but that's kind of where I'm floating right now. 13 matches. <laughs> okay. My range is seven. <laughs> uh, I'm I'm going to be very quick because I think you both have said it said a lot right and there's not a lot more i can add to it i just want to double down on what landon said as far as they had more to give okay i finished at right at 22 oh so like so i literally right behind nakamura and abushi and right ahead exactly where i put the triple a tag match yeah that's That's exactly 22 was where i was uh, but, uh, but, uh, you know, that is, well, the, I think it's funny is that was my original floor. That's probably why I, every time, out. every time. That's why I blurted out 21 instead of Paul says this every time we tell him something. No, no. Uh, cause I, I think at one point you asked what the floor was and I said, Oh, I believe that's number 21. You know I, what Spencer? We're psychics. We, we must be psychics. I think 21 well, was my original floor, but if you guys want to go at 22 or 20 or, or are we saying 22? Is that the number we're throwing out? That's what we threw out. I, I would say 22 was coming into this episode. That's where I stood. Oh, okay. Well, that was my floor. I mean, so I, I said I can easily be talked into that. I think my, my rationale um, behind going a little bit higher was just the massive, like just the intensity of this match. Uh, yes, there. I agree. That does leave a little bit to be desired, but I think that's the whole point of matches like this. Well, yeah, that's that is the whole point. This was supposed to be the first, and it was supposed to sort of spark this fire and and let everyone see. Oh my God, I can't wait to see what's next. Oh yeah, I, it absolutely accomplished that. What goal. follows is good stuff. Yeah, but I, I don't think it ever recaptures this magic though, and I think that's because after this we start, we get more and more gimmicks. And I don't think these two needed a gimmick. They just needed to have... No. Give them 25 minutes and just let them go. Well, right. and, and I, I said well sort said. of towards the beginning that the 13 and a half minutes would play into the ranking, and this is how. Yeah. Oh, I hear you. So that, that's, a, that's why that's why I gave myself like a 12-match like Buffer. area. And if you guys, are, you guys are only going one below what my floor was, and I've got no problem putting this at number 22. All right. 22 it is. How about that? For the 60th time... We've ranked it, and it's number 22 out of 60 in the greatest wrestling matches of all time. Boys, it's been one hell of a season three. Oh, man, there's been some highs. There's been some lows. There's been some technical difficulties. There's been some COVID. Uh, Yeah, there's there's been some uh, global outbreaks. (laughs) So uh, there's been some interesting things. Uh, But you know what I really loved about this season is having other people on our show. 
That's been a lot of fun. Uh, Corey Constantine. We've had him on. Oh my gosh, he's such a we, great guys, guy. Guys, we had Izzy on here. Yeah, yeah, we had Izzy on the show. I think that was last season. That um, was season two, wasn't we it? <laughs> had, uh, but we had, we did a joint show oh, with man. Then Now Whatever podcast. So what? fun. Our, last our, tape standing. Our best friends from across the pond. That's absolutely right. Uh, it's been a, a memorable season, no doubt about it. And I hope that uh, for you guys listening, it's helped provide sort of an escape like it has for us as oh, well. Yeah. Um, you know, as we enter into this new year, uh, you know, we were winding season three down, but the best is yet to come. Truly. Season four, season five. Uh, man, I, do we want to tell them what we're kicking off season four with? Or should we should we keep it under wraps? Oh. <laughs> I think <laughs> Okay, that was we'll tell them what we're kicking off season four with. In the season finale episode next week. All right. Well, there you go. You've said it. Get ready for our season finale next week. If you think we are total idiots and have ranked everything wrong, this is your chance to tell us how it really should be done. (laughs) Uh, But until our season three finale, I'm Spencer. I'm Paul. I'm Landon. And this is Last Match Standing. Standing.